my name is Fraser Simons. Today I've got some more Booker books for you. Uh, six or seven of them. Didn't count before I started the video. This is White on White by Ayo Sokol Savas, which I think I just butchered. This was a five-star book for me. Won't be for some people, but it was totally up my alley. This is a book about art. Uh, a woman goes to uh, rent a place in order to study gothic nude sculptures. Uh, she's a student and an academic, and she's primarily there for research. During that time, she reaches um, the person who is renting the suite to her. The wife is also a, a painter, and they strike up a sort of kind of friendship in which said wife is basically divulging her innermost secrets, turmoil, unloading, venting uh, to our narrator who rarely speaks. She is like a faceless entity. The reader becomes basically the person uh, that this person is telling their stories to. Each chapter is roughly like a very significant seemingly event in the person's life um, and it's very subjective. You're, you're meant to sort of be flailing in the dark and trying to figure out what it is she's trying to impart to her. Uh, there is a sort of plot in which these stories get more and more tense and it alludes to a kind of tumultuous relationship between wife and husband who are renting the, uh, the cheap villa to her to do her work um, and that it parallels each story with the work that she gets out of the actual like nude sculptures, the, the academia that she is sort of mining from those concepts and they sort of conjoin or marry in the context of the story. Um, and then it builds up to a conclusion that um, you may or may not have seen coming depending on what you took away from the subjectivity. I thought it was just completely captivating, amazing prose, riveting storytelling, uh, doesn't overstay its welcome in the least, really fantastic stuff. All interior, all uh, subjective thinking, no prescription whatsoever, which will It'll either be your cup or tea or not, uh, I think. The, what put it over into five stars was the ending for me, though. I, I really enjoyed it. Next, I read the new Aquake Ameze, uh, You Made a Fool of Death with Your Beauty, which is a romance novel. I would say it's highly predictable in its plot. Uh, a woman who is suffering from uh, tragedy is grieving her husband. Uh, some event has occurred that uh, has taken him away from her and she's sort of trying to re-entering social spheres, uh, rekindle her relationship with herself, uh, doesn't quite know how to go about it and is sort of like messily navigating the scene of dating uh, to find what she likes, what she doesn't like and, you know, just trying to deal with trauma basically. She's an artist and she is trying to process that through her art as well, which is one of the most interesting aspects of the story. Um, once it connects into, how to describe it, basically every hook with the plot is very apparent and where it goes from that directly leads into exactly what you think is going to happen next. It's a little bit contrived uh, as you, it's not so contrived outside of the romance genre, but even still it is very solipsistic. It is very much trying to tell a myopic story. Um, and it does succeed at that. I gave it three stars. It sets out what it sets to do, but it is just way too predictable. Uh, nothing ever comes out of left fields. People, people behave exactly as you might expect, uh, but the writing is still good. The conversations, especially some of the dialogue, uh, around consent, around um, being explicit and honest with a partner, and there's a particular monologue in here that resonated very well with me as well. Um, but plot-wise and everything that it was doing is very like open-handed and um, not breaking any new ground whatsoever and just sort of a cozy, predictable, fun kind of read and nothing more, I think. The Fell by Sarah Moss, COVID Simulator 1.0. Uh, 
more COVID anxiety simulator, more like this is a stream of consciousness uh, writing that centers, what are their names? Alice, the next door neighbor, uh, Kate, the woman who goes out into the fell, and her son, who's so bland, I can't remember the name of Matt, I think. Um, basically this, oh, and one other person, the um, person on a rescue team that routinely gets called out to look for people after it is too late, generally. Uh, it skips from chapter to chapter in very small sort of vignette style stuff, stream of consciousness, so it's exactly what's going through their head all of the time at a very granular level. Like, this is what is in their fridge, they get an egg, they clean off the egg, there's some poop on the egg, they clean it off, and then they start making a, a dinner and then you find out exactly all that kind of stuff, you know? So it's either going to be for you or not in that respect. I think it's fairly well written. It's fairly well executed for stream of consciousness, but not to the level that I expected based on the ratings of the book. Um, I gave this three stars. I think it justifies its existence uh, with some of the last pages, but it is very prescriptive about how it wants you to feel about the situation, what you should take away from it. Um, and some of the writing is just not strong enough to support some of the uh, characters in this book. And it goes into such granular detail about uh, stuff that we are already living through or have lived through very recently. And so it's just sort of monotonous and tedious to get through. Uh, being sort of, you know, stir crazy at home, uh, trying to... I don't know, weigh the advantages of getting out versus transmitting the disease to other people or getting the disease yourself or whatever. All that different stuff, uh, all the thoughts and feelings that you have when you're cooped up and dealing with the macro and micro aspects of COVID lockdown basically are articulated in this book. Um, and I already knew that stuff. <laughs> I don't think it's farther, uh, further enough away from the events that we all experienced already to have any insightful things about it. Um, it's pretty good at breaching the the notions of like responsibility uh, for a community as well as like sort of the selfishness of the dynamics of which we're like socialized with and stuff but uh, as well as some touching moments where people sort of like help one another out and, and, and stuff like that but it is very predictable and prescriptive and what it wants you to take away again so it was kind of yeah it, it is what it is on the tin basically for me next i consumed mercury pictures presents as an arc this comes out in let's see august 2nd so pretty soon uh, this is by anthony uh, morrow i have not read any of this author's stuff before but i guess he's kind of like a big deal and i just didn't know about it Mercury Pictures presents, I think the marketing is way off on though. I give this, first of all, I give it five stars. I thought it was phenomenal, but it is nothing like I expected based on the marketing. Uh, so basically the best way to describe this, I think is like a polyphonic book rather than what it suggests on the marketing as being centered on an Italian immigre um, at a very young age, comes from Italy, uh, who was uh, living under a dictatorship, essentially. It is quite a while uh, before uh, the Pearl Harbor events and then leads up to that aspect. But as it does so, it numerously <laughs> digresses into other characters, which is why I think it's best to think of as a polyphonic book. It goes into a few other characters that revolve sort of peripherally around uh, the picture company that one of the main characters owns, her boss in this case, um, but generally it digresses into like such different territory that it's strange that it centers the motion picture as like the central piece of this sort of uh, book because it's like not that much of a set piece, like it's not a time and place rooted in the actual pictures, um, but they do have peripheral entanglements with it, so I guess that's where they went with it. Uh, we have a character who is a German immigrant uh, who leaves under the Hitler regime and works at the pictures doing like uh, miniature work. That was just completely fascinating. Her name's Anna. She left behind a son. 
then we have uh, Vin uh, Vincent, who the story is very convoluted, but he's also an immigrant from Italy. Uh, he knows the main character. Their stories diverge in great directions where the beginning is like very granular with uh, Kate's story. It goes in a completely different direction for Vincent. Um, and then also we learn about Kate's family of characters, the boss, as I mentioned. And so there's a lot of different things going on. So much so that you don't notice that there's really not much of a plot happening because it's just so fascinating. Uh, when you get around halfway in, I think the plot is becomes more um, predominant, but a lot of it is merely setting up these things and it, it becomes clear that it's interrogating how immigrants are treated, the American dream, um, the responsibility and the um, great nature of which propaganda has taken a toll and changed history as well as like won wars as well as like the responsibility of creating these things that people consume and associate their identity with and form an identity on basically uh, and it takes place in a, at a time when not many people were really thinking about this very much and all from an immigrant perspective and all with very different kind of story arcs than I think you might expect. All of the endings to their stories are tied up with a very significant and very excellent bow. Um, just perfect endings where it's not like movie star, movie-esque type endings, um, but also says something very intrinsic about themselves and how their story feels like it should have ended even though you didn't see it coming. And uh, Eddie's in particular, Kate's boyfriend, who is a, uh, I believe, naturalized uh, Japanese um, citizen at the time, is like shoehorned into bit parts for the the pictures and can never get like uh, theatrical work that he really wants and whatnot. His story in particular, his ending is just the piece a la resistance is just incredible. Um, it made me very excited to consume the rest of the book because it's tied up at a place that you wouldn't expect and then leaves you guessing as to what will happen next basically. Uh, yeah, it's just an incredible piece of writing. It's gonna be one of my favorite books of the year, I think. And I wish that the marketing was better for it because it's just like a motion picture sort of marketing book thing, but it's kind of about that, but not really. So I don't know, I hope, I really hope that it does well and, and, and it people pick it up. But for me, if this wasn't an eligible book, it wasn't on my radar at all. So I don't know. Um, the prose work, by the way, also is absolutely excellent. It is very funny, it's very moving, it's very poignant without being very prescriptive, which you know I like. Um, and it feels like a movie, it feels unreal, and there's meta aspects put in the story about that. Like, so it feels very movie picture-esque, but also simultaneously real and unreal. So it's just... Yeah, it's an immaculate construction, basically, I think. Um, it, I was always consuming it, wanting to consume it, wanting to get back to it to consume it. And I think I read it in like the space of 24 hours or something. Just absolutely incredible. Next, I read Booth by Karen Joy Fowler. I gave this four stars. This is on audio with the narrator being somebody who's not named. Um, so maybe I can find that and put it if I remember. This is a historical fiction piece that it has gotten a lot of love lately, I think, on booktube. It centers the Booth family, who is very famous for a very uh, known reason. <laughs> but it is really good at not centering that particular person um, and showing the family's wild story. Like, it's just something that feels very heavily researched and she's very upfront about some things being... Um, uh, fictionalized because there's just there's just not any information as to certain aspects of the story that she goes into at the end but this even the stuff that is known is just the story is is wild um, and it feels very theatrical and kind of like a 
a play that is being um, enacted even with the prose work, which is very good because it uh, parallels the primary, like the, the father figure basically of the, or grandfather, depending on where you are in the story, uh, of the family who was a really famous actor and pioneered the way for this family, but then was like not a very good person, didn't raise his kids very well. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that I don't want to give away, but yeah, it's just a it's just a wild story that goes into a lot of different digressions, a lot of uh, set pieces and centering of the female characters in it that are just really fascinating and and, and weird uh, people who have done strange things. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I thought it was better than I expected especially for somebody that doesn't really consume historical fiction all that much. I definitely would recommend it. It's hard to talk about without giving some things away. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree with the hype that it's getting. It's not a five star book for me because it does go into some very granular detail that feels very perfunctory. Um, and it felt kind of like padding to me, but I think historical fiction buffs would be interesting in what I think is the padding of the story. So uh, the narration was also quite good, like a four out of five star thing. Next, I consumed King Lear and The Lear Wife. Both are four star books. Uh, I watched the Stratford Festival uh, production of King Lear while having the book on my lap. It was really phenomenal just because I wanted to go into this knowing, but you really don't need to, I would say. Um, everything that is pertinent comes back into certain sections of the book and the beginning of the book sets up what happens at the end of King Lear. So, um, still a fun thing to do though. So King Lear is written by J.R. Thorpe. This is a four star book that could have easily been a five star book if it had been truncated a little bit. It is, uh, I think, informed a little bit by, um, shoot, what's her name, Aquitaine? someone of Aquitaine. Basically the story from uh, Matrix of Lauren Groff's Matrix, that Eleanor of Aquitaine maybe, something like that. Um, I think th it's sort of like a fictionalized accounting that marries somebody who could have been the wife of Lear with that story. Uh, she is exiled um, in the King Lear, never mentioned really again. Um, and this extrapolation posits that she ended up in an abbey and basically is living out her life when she finds out what happens to her family and what happens to her kids and all this kind of stuff. And the story is more or less plot driven by her wanting to leave the Abbey, but not being able to because of obstacles. Um, each section of the book, I think there's four parts, has a different sort of conflict that she has to deal with. She's an older woman now, in her 50s, 55, 58, something like that. Um, she's whip crap, crack smart. She's just a phenomenal character. Uh, the prose in this are staggeringly good, like better than King Lear, I would say. I, it's completely enthralling, completely interior, not plot driven, but has a plot kind of book. Uh, if you're not into the actual concept of this woman, dealing with like grief and the sort of dual timeline action of her digressing into the family members from King Lear, expounding on who they were not portrayed as uh, in the actual play, like how they became the people that they became. Um, and then her being situated back into her, you know, physicality of this Abbey and, and the trials that they have to go through basically at this place. Um, it won't keep you along despite the voice, I think. It is a very compelling voice, one of the best that I've consumed, but there's not that much going on if you're not really kind of invested in this particular viewpoint because there's not that much stuff happening at the Abbey. Um, it is not a happening place. <laughs> what kept me going was her voice and the overall plot arc, which um, the reason why it is a four star read also is that it navigates to a point of, while well, I can see why she made this, the plot development 
and the particular plot beats revolving around this made sense, it is a fairly predictable and mundane conclusion to something that artificially feels pumped up because of the voice. It's very rich. Um, it will sink you absolutely right in. The, the font is quite small, actually but kept me reading uh, another book that I consumed in like a 24 hour time period. It's a really fantastic piece of literature. Like I said, a few small tweaks, easily a five star read. Next, I consumed Here Goes Nothing by Steve Toltz. This is a three star book. It is absurdist, apoplectic satire, is what I described it as, with a man, basically, if you think of like a sitcom, sort of like Dead Like Me, that's the vibes that it's going for in which a guy who is a career criminal marries a woman who's very like feathery light spiritual person who is constantly questioning things in the universe whereas he is uh, incredibly sort of balanced on angry and moral relativism I basically think uh, thinks that he has got spirituality all figured out until they have invite a stranger in their home with the promises of money uh, because he is a doctor who's been diagnosed with a very esoteric disease in which he will die. He claims that this is his family house and he wants to die there. He has no friends, no family, etc. Plot twists ensue. He dies somehow and from the great beyond finds himself in a Kafka-esque type situation uh, a replicated into a world very much like our own except that it's even more confusing even more about work even more about treachery um, and they still have like physicality and stuff so it's basically about pseudo philosophical leanings in which it's interrogating somewhat these notions more like articulating them rather than interrogating them for fodder uh, of the satirical bent in which he is constantly doing jokes and quips and it's constant, just constant jokes. <laughs> it is in the beginning hit and miss, more to the miss uh, side of things, where the story does find um, some semblance of endearment to me was uh, the actual plot beats regarding him and his wife, even after he is dead. He finds like a, a way basically to scry and see what is going on in the real world versus the the fake world or whatever his, his death world purgatory um and this stirs up all manner of things basically in him uh and there is endearing moments in the story between them as well as the overall plot arc that worked however the humor was not kind of my kind of humor it is a very long book it could have severely been truncated i think uh, it is kind of like too smart for its own good while not coming up with any answers itself because there's no answers to the questions that it raises. And so the only thing that it can do is really laugh at these things. And it becomes very overly tiresome, especially at like 384 pages or something like that. Um, yeah, so it kind of barely got a pass for me. It's like 2.5 rounded up to three stars. And then I read The Colony by Audrey... McGee, I consume this uh, on audio as well as physical. It has unusual prose style in which there are no uh, quotation marks and the stream of consciousness embodied in it um, take on the personality quirks and um, lateral thinking versus vertical thinking of the two sort of guests of an island. There's an Englishman and a Frenchman that are ferried from um, uh, I can't remember where actually, but they're ferried to an island, uh, a colony, as it might suggest, in 1979, uh, in which it's an uh, all Irish speaking uh, village. The cast is just the Englishman, the Frenchman, uh, the fairy guy named Francis, um, and then the grandmother and daughter of hers um, and the son of the daughter, James, and that's it. Basically, the Englishman has come to uh, to paint the cliffs um, and kind of be the, the new Monet, basically, as the, the Frenchman drills him with all the time. And the Frenchman is conducting an academic study 
uh, and seeing how the Irish language is dying out just by kind of observing and figuring out sort of where the language has come from in this particular place. He's had to like learn it, uh, the particular dialect, and then is very um, troubled basically to find that the Englishman has come because his very presence upsets the equanimity of the island and uh, has disastrous sort of circumstances played out by his mere presence in the way that he goes about the world. It is very much about interrogating colonialism in a lot of different facets. It alternates chapters generally uh, between what is happening on the island between the characters, which is like very interior, very low key things. Like it's literally just the guy there and he's painting and interacting with the residents and so uh, with the Frenchman as well. There's no like bombastic things to, to keep you here, but the writing is absolutely immersive, I think. Um, and again, displays their thought processes. Mason is, or Masson is more like a, a brick and mortar type thinking. So all of his sentences run together into paragraphs and, and like, it, it seems like he's very anxious and very like, um, sort of like cultured, but also everything is a paragraph, like everything runs into the other, whereas the Englishman constantly digresses into like these sort of cinematic portrayals of his own existence uh, because he is thinking of everything in terms of like painting something. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, lateral digressions that break up his paragraphs. And again, on audio, this is a lot more explicit and fantastic. The audio book is going to be one of my favorites of the year, maybe all time, just because there's a lot of Irish spoken. Um, and it's easier to delineate the characters. There's a lot of personality. He's just a fantastic narrator. It's really great to consume this at the same time as the audiobook. Um, but yeah, it's a fairly quiet story that's very powerful, I think, because it replicates the damage that Colonial does by mere presence of a foreigner, but also by the ways in which they navigate uh, the world and what they expect from other people that have been subjugated by their uh, by their culture and how they go about getting what they want and how they treat other people, basically. Uh, it builds into a very tense um, denouement, I guess you could say. It's very sad, very reflective, um, very poignant, and I, I gave it five stars. I thought it was absolutely phenomenal. The hype is real about this one, I think. And those are the Booker books that I have consumed so far. I'm got like another five or ten something like that to consume for these videos. I'll keep making them until I'm all cut up and then I'll probably do another updated long list thing. Um, I think Shelly wants to do that so that'll be on her channel um, and I look forward to talking to her about all these books and crafting a new uh, long list based on all the things that I've consumed as well as her. I actually buddy read this too, I forgot to say, with Shelly. Um, which was a fantastic experience as always. Shelley has a lot of insights about the prose work, about the different pacing and the more like granular mechanics because she was consuming it uh, solely on the page, I think on a Kindle, whereas I was very swept up in the story because I was listening to the audiobook and following along um, with the written word. So yeah. Anyway, that's it. Hopefully this video isn't too long as I always say. Thoughts, comments in below, and I will get back to you in a timely manner as usual. See you next time.